The Secretary of Health and Human Services administers the Medicare and Medicaid programs, which provide health insurance for millions of elderly, disabled, and low-income Americans. In November of 2021, the Secretary announced that in order to receive Medicare and Medicaid funding, participating facilities must insure their staff, unless exempt for medical or religious reasons, are vaccinated against COVID-19. Two district courts enjoined enforcement of the rule, and the government now asks us to stay those injunctions. Agreeing that's entitled to such relief, we grant the application. The Medicare program provides health insurance to individuals 65 and older, as well as those with specific disabilities. The Medicare program does the same for those with low income. Both Medicare and Medicaid are administered by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who has general statutory authority to promulgate regulations, as may be necessary to the efficient administration of the functions for which he's charged. One such function, perhaps the most basic, given the department's core mission, is to ensure the health care providers who care for Medicare and Medicaid patients protect their patients' health and safety. Such providers include hospitals, nursing homes, ambulatory surgical centers, hospices, rehabilitation facilities, and more. To that end, Congress authorized the Secretary to promulgate, as a condition of facilities participation in the programs, that be Medicare and Medicaid, such requirements as he finds necessary in the interest of health and safety of individuals who are furnished services in the institution. Relying on these authorities, the Secretary has established a long list of detailed conditions with which facilities must comply to be eligible to receive Medicare and Medicaid funds. Such conditions have a long included a requirement that certain providers maintain and enforce an infection prevention and control program design to help prevent the development and transmission of communicable diseases and infections. On November the 5th of 2021, the Secretary issued an interim final rule amending the existing conditions of participation in Medicare and Medicaid to add a new requirement, that facilities ensure that their covered staff are vaccinated against COVID-19. The rule requires providers off to offer medical and religious exemptions and does not cover staffs who telework full-time. A facility's failure to comply may lead to monetary penalties, denial of payment for new administration, and ultimately termination of participation in Medicare and Medicaid. All right, so we have the thing set up, right? This is part of the government funding provision, right? The government using the power of the purse. The government has Medicare and Medicaid. Hospitals are allowed to take this or not. They don't have to. It is a program that's provided by the government. If you do take the money, the money comes with strings. This is one of the ways the government gets to do stuff, is through the money power, because states and hospitals like to go, yay, money. And so they take the money, and the money comes with things because the government says, if you want our money, if you want this big, big pile of money, you have to do things. And it's subject to our regulations. And one of the regulations might be, for example, whether or not you have to take this vaccine. So the question is, what is the authority for the Secretary of Health and Human Services to require this as part of the condition of accepting the money? If you don't want the money, you don't have to accept the condition. But do you have to accept the condition? Because the Secretary of Health and Human Services can't do everything. So, you know, let's see what they, whether or not they can require this. 20 U.S. News says it's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's a, it is a very big stick, yes. Or very big carrot, I guess. The Secretary issued the rule after finding vaccination of healthcare workers against COVID-19 wasn't necessary for the health and safety of individuals who care for for the services that are furnished. In many facilities, 35% or more of staff remain unvaccinated. This was apparently true at the time the case was being decided, obviously. May it be less true now. And of those staff, the Secretary explained, they pose a serious threat to health and safety of patients. That determination was based on data showing the COVID-19 virus can spread rapidly among healthcare workers and from them to patients, and such spread is more likely when they are unvaccinated. Again, this may or may not continue to be true, but these were the findings at the time. And the question might be whether or not the agency had a basis to believe them at the time, regardless of what might be true now, because we can only determine things based on the time that they're adopted. So pressing on whether or not these are true in some absolute sense, we will just say that they were true for the purposes of the exercise because they were true or at least true enough at the time the regulation was adopted. Let's press on. He also explained that because Medicare or Medicaid patients are often elderly, disabled, or otherwise in poor health, transmission of COVID-19 to such patients is particularly dangerous. In addition to the threat posed by inner facility of transmission itself, the Secretary also found that fear of exposure to the virus from acts of unvaccinated health care can lead patients to themselves for going to seek medically necessary care, creating further risk to patient health and safety. 
Further noting that staffing shortages caused by COVID-19 relating exposure or illness has disrupted patient care. Again, these are findings that are being made at the time the regulation is going into effect. So again, whatever is true now is a little neither here nor there because we're going to whether or not the agency could form the regulations based on what they knew or at least said they knew at the time. The secretary issued the rule as an interim final rule rather than through typical notice and comment after finding good cause it should be made effective immediately. The good cause was, in short, the secretary's belief that any further delay would endanger patient self safety given the spread of the Delta variant and upcoming winter season. We're going back in time, obviously. Shortly after the interim rules announcement, two groups of states, one led by Louisiana and another by Mississippi, filed separate actions challenging the rule. The United States District Court for the Western District of Louisiana and the Eastern District of Missouri each found the rule to be defective and entered a preliminary injunction against enforcement. In each case, the government moved for a stay of the injunction from the relevant Court of Appeals. In Louisiana, the Fifth Circuit denied the motion. In the Eighth Circuit, they, they did so as well. The government filed an application asking us to stay the injunction, and we heard both and we heard expedite argument on request. So the district courts and courts of appeal have said no, this was an improper regulation, and also we're not going to issue an injunction. The US Supreme Court, acting expeditiously, says, okay, fine, we're going to consider both of these and we're going to decide it on the merits as well. All right, so let's do that. First, we agree with the government that the secretary's rule falls within the authority that Congress has conferred. Congress has authorized the secretary to impose conditions on the recipient of these federal funds that the secretary finds necessary to be in the interest of health. COVID-19 is highly contagious, dangerous, and especially for the patients at issue, a deadly disease because they do tend to be elderly, which I think is definitely a risk factor. The Secretary for Health and Human Services to determine the vaccine mandate will substantially reduce the likelihood that healthcare workers will contract the virus and transmit it. Again, the degree to which this is true under the current factual posture is not necessarily the question because we're trying to determine whether or not the regulation was proper, which goes into what the Secretary did or did not know at the time the regulation was promulgated. The Secretary of Health and Human Services has determined that COVID-19 mandate will reduce the virus. He accordingly concluded the vaccine mandate is necessary to promote and protect the patient health. The rule thus fits neatly within the language of the statute. So this is just going to be statutory through and through, right? The, con the, Congress, has, the Congress says, would you like some money? Everyone goes, yay, money. The money comes with conditions. The everyone goes, yay, money. Here's some of the conditions. It's just spending power. So it makes logical sense. After all, ensuring that providers take steps to avoid transmitting the virus to their patients is consistent with the fundamental principle of medical profession. First, do no harm. It would be the very opposite of efficient administration for the facility that's supposed to make people well to make them sick. The states and Justice Thomas offer a narrow review of the various authorities at issue, contending that they seemingly broad language cited the above authority to impose no more than a list of bureaucratic rules regarding the technical administration of Medicare and Medicaid. But the long-standing practice of health and human services in implementing the relevant statutory authorities tells a different story. As noted above, healthcare facilities that wish to participate in Medicare and Medicaid, again, you don't have to, you just give up a huge pile of money, have all, always been obligated to satisfy a host of conditions that address safe and efficient provision of healthcare, not simply accounting. Such requirements govern for detail, for example, the amount of time after administration or surgery which a hospital patient must be examined and by whom. The procurement, transportation, transport, transplantation of human kidneys, livers, lungs, and pancreas, the task that may be, the task that may be delegated by a physician to a physician assistant or nurse, and most pertinent here, the pro programs that hospitals must be implemented to govern the surveillance, prevention, and control of infectious disease. Moreover, the secretary routinely imposes conditions of participation that relate the qualifications and duties of healthcare workers themselves. The secretary has always justified these sorts of requirements by citing authority to protect patient health and safety. As these examples illustrate the secretary role in administering Medicare and Medicaid goes far beyond that of a mere bookkeeper. Indeed, respondents do not contest the validity of this long-standing lineage of healthcare regulations. When asked at oral argument whether the secretary could, using the very same authority, requiring hospital employees to wear gloves, sterilize instruments, wash their hands in certain ways and at certain intervals, Missouri answered yes. The secretary certainly has authority to implement all kinds of infection control measures at the facilities. It's one of the conditions by taking the money. Of course, the vaccine mandate goes further than what the secretary has done in the past to implement infection control. 
but he's never had to address an infection problem of the scale and scope before. I mean, since the office has existed, this is true enough, I suppose. In any event, there can be no doubt that addressing the infection in Medicare and Medicaid facilities is what he does. I mean, that is definitely one of his roles in life, yes. And his response is not surprising. Vaccination requirements are a common feature of a provision of healthcare in America. Healthcare workers around the country are ordinarily required to be vaccinated for diseases such as hepatitis B, influenza, and measles, mumps, and rubella. As the secretary has explained, these pre-existing state requirements are a major reason the agency has not previously adopted vaccine requirements as a condition. So why have we not previously adopted vaccine requirements? Well, because under relevant state law, they are typically required to be vaccinated anyway. So there was really no reason for us to do this. This is a new vaccine and is not being required by the states, at least up to this point. So now there's a reason. These are Medicare Medicaid facilities. The elderly are particularly vulnerable to COVID. This seems to be well true. If you look at the numbers of COVID, it does seem very much the case that the elderly are significantly impacted. Is vaccinating the healthcare workers a way to prevent transmission or to ensure their health? Well, the question is, of course, what did we know at the time of the regulation? Is the question of will this help? And even if it's not a perfect, even if it's not perfect, it doesn't have to be perfect because a lot of measures aren't necessarily perfect. So the question is, is it helpful? Does it help? which is a different question, incidentally, to like, is it perfect? So even, even on the current numbers, it might be very helpful to reducing the infection. So is this a kind of thing that he can do? Well, the Secretary of Health and Human Services has wide-reaching authority because Congress says he does. He has wide-reaching authority under a statute. Congress has the authority because it's part of the spending power. Congress's authority comes from the would-you-like-some-money provision of the Constitution. And everyone goes, yay, money. So this is one of the things that comes with the money. So it makes perfect logical sense from basic statutory principles. Whether or not you think it's an effective thing to do or whether or not you think it's a good thing to do, it's something that makes total sense from the principles of the statutes we're trying to interpret. All this is perhaps why healthcare workers and public health organizations overwhelmingly support the secretary's rule. Indeed, their support suggests that vaccination requirements under these circumstances is a straightforward and predictable example of health and safety regulations that Congress has authorized the secretary to impose. We accordingly conclude the secretary did not exceed the statutory authority in requiring that in order to remain eligible for the dollars, the facilities required by the interim rule must ensure their employees are vaccinated against COVID-19. Thus, that brings us to the end of this case of Biden versus Missouri, a case dealing with COVID-19 mandates. In this particular case, however, the mandates are coming as a provision of the federal government's funding power, their spending power. They would like to have Medicare and Medicaid. One of the ways they do that is by giving money. And they say, hey, facilities, would you like some money? And they say, yes, we would very much. Now, the relevant statutes that Congress passed says that health and human services can, you know, make sure the facilities are up to snuff, including through health measures. And the statutory language is broad enough to cover this, which it does seem to be. This seems to be within the province of the health and human services. So it makes total logical sense, therefore, that this is part of the provisions that the health administration has put in place. So if you want the money, it comes with these conditions. And that brings us to the end of consideration of this case.